All right, and we are recording. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Get Surveillance Tech uh, Copaganda Out of Fiction panel. Uh, I am so pleased to see you all here today. Uh, this panel is is happening because I bothered Scott <laughs> a lot when uh, right when a call for short stories was first coming together and being imagined between four really incredible partners, uh, my organization, Fight for the Future, the uh, RightsCon uh, 2025, which is taking place in Taipei, Taiwan this February, uh, Compost Magazine, and the fantastic folks at Strange Horizons, which is a very fancy literary magazine that as a as author, I'm like super jazzed to be working with them on a project. Uh, and uh, this story call is the first step towards building a toolkit for people who create fictional worlds, fictional stories on how better to represent, represent surveillance technologies, um, both uh, specifically when they are being used by um, law enforcement, uh, and also in general, uh, because as activists, we see the power of fiction, the power of the stories that are told in helping us to imagine a better or a worse future. And we know that but as the boots on the ground resisting the very harmful impacts of a lot of these technologies, we know that if these stories that we see and the lived experiences that, that, that come to us through our work um, and resistance are actually <laughs> that door is making a funny noise. Um, the stor stories that we see in our resistance are actually uh, often more compelling than what we see on the big screen. And if they are able to be represented and spread uh, instead of whatever it is that folks in Hollywood or folks who maybe don't have the experience or education that we do um, have uh we could we could really have a better world based on the stories that we're telling to each other on the biggest stages so we will be um, looking for five short stories that are going to be published in strange horizons for this contest and uh one of those writers will end up getting sent to taipei to participate with us in the initial stages of putting together the toolkit and then we'll put the toolkit out in a uh radically decentralized censorship free way um, through Compost Magazine on the inter interplanetary file system so that uh, nobody can block it and it'll be there as a resource for everybody uh, as long as we've got an internet, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, let's get into the panel instead of my lecture. If you would like to learn more about this contest, I have little zines up here. I also have stickers, so come see me after. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with some intros from our panel. Um, and I'm just going to ask name, pronoun, uh, your org, your title, um, and maybe what's the role of fiction in your life? I'm John Padfield. I am a business professor, uh, former Indiana State Representative, and been in involved in uh, the fight for privacy for quite a while. I'm a fan of fiction. I have not written, but a uh, big fan of fiction. And one of the things that I pay special attention to is the way that the arts, movies, music, and everything else impact society. What do they normalize? What do they not normalize? And I see a lot of influence when it comes to surveillance technology and the way that it's depicted, basically telling everyone, this is normal. You shouldn't be worried about it. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I work with a group called Public Knowledge. Um, we're a DC-based advocacy organization uh, that represents consumer interests in a wide range of tech policy issues, um, including things like privacy. Um, and, you know, we, we don't get super deep into surveillance, but we do work a lot on privacy issues. Um, I am a I am a writer, um, a short story writer, primarily aspiring novelist. We'll see if I ever get there. Um, and just a, an addict of storytelling. Um, you know, I think that stories are fundamentally what make people people. They're how we understand the world. Um, and you being able to use stories as a model for how we think about emerging problems is a running theme throughout tech policy, particularly. Um, I kind of have a hobby about going off on the, the feedback loop between sci-fi and tech policy. Um, so it's, and it's very, very real. Hi, uh, Matthew Lane, pronouns he, him. Uh, I'm a colleague uh, of Leah at Fight for the Future. I'm senior policy counsel there. 
And I am primarily uh, just a massive consumer of uh, fiction, uh, a lot of sci-fi and fantasy. And I, um, I, I love how the stories create space to uh, tease out and explore very complicated, very difficult issues in kind of the safe space of this isn't reality. And so those tend to be the stories that I'm drawn to. And I think that uh, in a lot of ways, those are stories that really help inform policy. Thank you all so much. I'm Leah Holland. They, she, I'm campaigns and comms director at Fight for the Future. And I just learned that John has actually prepared a little bit of a history of copaganda and how it has changed over the years for us. And I think that's a really great place to start. So John, please take us, take us away with a little rundown. I have to admit the first time I ever heard the word copaganda was looking at the panels that were going to be offered today. But, but as soon as I read the word, I immediately knew what it was talking about because I have seen it over and over again. And I did not realize just how far back propaganda goes. Uh, when I started doing a little bit of reading about the history of police propaganda in mainstream media, it goes all the way back to Andy Griffith. Um, it was subtle, but over time it's become a little less subtle. Um, not going to go into a ton of detail here just for the sake of time, but 1967, the LAPD created the first SWAT team. And it was largely in response to campus protest, civil unrest. They decided we need a, a special weapons and tactics team to deal with large events. That was 1967. 1970s, there were some things going on. A few other communities decided to do SWAT teams. 1975 is a key year. That's when Hollywood came out with the TV show SWAT. Uh, Robert Ul Ulrich, Ulrich. Uh, Steve Forrester and a few others, but they, they are the ones that made SWAT teams. How on earth can your small town of 40,000 people exist without a SWAT team? Everyone has to have one because every week, massive gangs of armed bikers are terrorizing towns. And the weeks that they're not doing that, drug cartels are coming in and terrorizing towns. And uh, th this led into the 80s and 90s. 80s and 90s, a lot of the propaganda was really focused on the war on drugs. And that's when we were seeing uh, uh, shows like Miami Vice, um, several others, movies, Carlito's Way and uh, Scarface. And then 9-11 happened. And by this point, police forces around the country have pretty much been militarized throughout the 80s and 90s because we have to have machine guns and armored vehicles and helicopters and rocket launchers and everything else to protect us from the bikers and the, the drug cartels. 9-11 hits and the propaganda starts shifting. It's no longer about the weaponry, now it's about the intelligence. How are we going to stop that next terrorist attack? And over and over, you're seeing stories of, well, this 12-year-old this girl was abducted, but thankfully there was an ATM machine across the street. We were able to get some video off of it. And um, so th these things start working their way into fiction. And yes, ATM footage is real. It, it has been used. But what happens is we see it on TV on a regular basis, and we start to assume it's much more common than what it really is. Purdue University, a, a doctoral student a few years ago, did a a study, uh, the, the survey asked people about how much do they watch of forensics TV shows, CSI, NCSI, uh, some of the other shows that really focus on uh, forensic technology. They ask questions about how much do you watch, and then they ask questions about what percent of murder cases do you think involve DNA? What percent of murder cases do you think involve these different technologies? there was an incredibly strong correlation. The more people watch these shows, the more they expect, if I'm ever called as a juror, I'm gonna see all this evidence because that's normal. That's what I see on TV every every night. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I just wanna sum up saying, propaganda has been around for a long time, but the agenda changes over time. And right now surveillance seems to be the dominant theme. Thank you, yeah. So. In preparation for a panel here uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. on private police foundations, I've been 
doing a lot of reading and uh, I've learned that we are all in the most surveilled city in the US right now. And uh, with, with that surveillance, I, I think comes either a lot of, a, a lot of uh, discomfort for those who are aware of it and how it might be used or, or just a lot or nothing <laughs> or really bad consequences for um, people who are subjected to it all the time. One of the things that was interesting coming out here, um, and this isn't necessarily like a, a, a propaganda, but a normalization of surveillance is that I actually had to consent to biometric data collection in order to check into my hotel. <laughs> which is pretty wild. Like my app had an app and the app's app uh, required me to essentially give up my face. So I, I played dumb with the hotel assistant, uh, with the concierge desk <laughs> for about two days first on the app. And then when I got there and I don't really, I'm, I'm not, I didn't consciously consent to anything, but um, did they just sign me up anyway? There, there's some questions around that. So it, it and I'm saying all this to point out that it's creepy that we're in the most surveilled city in the country right now. It's creepy that I essentially had to give up biometric data to be used for God knows what, um, just to have a place to stay here. I'm curious for the people that work with privacy or with surveillance, if you could share with us a little bit more, um, or maybe what, what is your creepy surveillance tech story? What is the thing that sort of haunts you about privacy or surveillance that you've come across in your work um, that might set the stage a little bit for the other side of the coin here, since we've got propaganda down? Uh, I will say not, not something I deal with directly in my work, but I've got two young kids. I've got a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and when they're not tearing my house apart, um, they go to school and or daycare. Um, and the amount of surveillance, frankly, that is being put on very young kids is kind of shocking. Um, I had been heartened to see nowadays you actually need to sign a form to allow the daycares to use your kid's picture in their social media. They used to just do it. Um, yeah, and I, th I think there's, you know, we always hear these, they're even setting aside the horror stories that we hear about, like, teenagers with Chromebooks that are assigned by their school where it's been found out that the Chromebook laptop, that the Chromebook cameras have been turned on remotely in a kid's bedroom. Um, at like, you know, whatever hours of day and night, you know, there have been actual lawsuits about this. Um, and I think we are, we have this sort of, this, this social, I don't want to call it a problem, but there's a pattern socially when we have this emergence of new technology where there's sort of an acclimation period. Um, and when you're young, you acclimatize to it a lot faster. Um, you know, because this is kind of the only world that you know, like, you know, my kids know that if they want to get into my iPhone and they don't know my passcode, they just take it and they point it at my face and then they can play as much Angry Birds as they want. Um, and uh, it is very funny to watch my seven year old do that to my father in law and just go, hey, Poppy, and then hold up his iPad and then she's just on Angry Birds. Um, but yeah, kids get used to this really fast. And so having to have those conversations with them early is kind of difficult, you know, to try to explain what you know why they should maybe start thinking about these things take notice of why are people asking you for your pictures why are people asking you for personal data again seven-year-old we're not going to get in a whole lot of personal data situations she's not going to be giving out her social security number or anything um but yeah having to having to have those conversations with them early i think is something that socially we're just kind of now coming around to the realization that we need to do um, and so we're on the middle of the time lag of, of watching the next generation come up and have a response to that. I don't have a personal story, but I have a childhood friend who um, works in startup tech and he was telling me a story and he's like in an adjacent industry. So he's insanely private personally and uh, doesn't post most of his pictures on social media if at all. And uh, he was in a meeting with another company, um, I'm not going to name, but uh, they were like, here, let me show you what we do. And they took his picture and they found every picture that he was in the background of, like Facebook pictures from people he'd never met before that like while he was traveling, he was just in the back of their photos. And he was just like, yeah, this is like insanely maddening because like I can't even control that, like I can't control what other people are posting that I might be in the background of the picture. <laughs> I, I don't have a personal horror story, but I'll, I'll share with you um, on my YouTube channel. I just made a recent video about uh, 
Amazon purchased iRobot, and so now Roomba is owned by Amazon. And think about that when you have this little floor-mounted camera running around your house, mapping your house, and uh, all that data is going to Amazon. MIT Review had a story about a woman in Venezuela whose photo appeared on Facebook of her sitting on the toilet because her Roomba went into the bathroom while she was in the bathroom. And the, the title of the article was um, Venezuelan woman uh, on toilet appears on Facebook. How did this happen? I don't think the robot did it itself. But uh, obviously, number one, it has the ability to take your picture. And number two, somebody had access to that. So that, that's uh, something for anyone that has a, a robot to think about. Yeah, something something for anybody who has uh, an Amazon Ring to think about, or an Alexa, because or who walks down the street um, because those rings are pointed at you, or who walks down the street where an Amazon truck drives by you because those cameras are pointed at you. Or FedEx. It, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty insidious. We um, where I live, we recently just got the cute new Amazon trucks with like the circle lights and everything. And I'm like, oh, you're so, you're like, you're designed to make me feel comfortable around you. And it, yeah. um, all right, it's so we did, <laughs> so we did surveillance, we did copaganda. Let's do fiction. So uh, fiction impacts policy it impacts policy makers um the the stories that 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 are told that reach them uh often end up being what we uh the stories that are told in order to get laws passed or to defeat them and and, and it's interesting because this happens in the same way that authors might reach for a tech fix to fix a plot hole or um, cops and corporations might reach for a text fix, tech fix in their narrative of like, oh no, something, something bad happened, or we, 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 we don't, we, we would like to have a greater success rate or, or what have you. So we're just going to say that the computer is going to fix it. If you just give us all of this money or if this private police foundation gives us all of this money, then sure we'll be able to, um, say that we're doing something about gun violence because we've got these always on microphones in every neighborhood shot spotter that are detecting the gunshots and sending police there with something like an 80 percent air rate or what happens what have you in chicago but it's fixing it um so long as as long as they're able to shape that narrative and say that they've done the thing and that it's good and um quash the feedback from activists that actually there's like kind of an 80 percent air, air rate and it's hugely wasting police resources so um that's one imp illustration of the import of narrative um, and a fiction that the police are creating with a surveillance technology. But I'd be really interested to hear some other examples of how fiction impacts policy. If y'all want to, yeah, hey, yeah, Matt, I'm teeing you up. I, I don't want to <laughs> take this story away from you, Chris. No, you're gonna you're gonna get the details better than I am. All right. So um, there are there are two examples. One recent one historic about how movies have had significant impact over the course of policy. The first was uh, the movie War Games. Um, hands up if you've seen War Games. <laughs> Two hands if you love War Games. <laughs> so, um, you know, Reagan was an actor. I think it was fairly well known that he liked to screen movies at the White House. A uh, new movie comes out called War Games. He's like, oh, what's this? screens it comes away terrified uh because you know the the world it portrayed is one where like computers could accidentally start you know a world war um based on you know basically people like a chain of comedy of errors but um so he like asked his his uh advisors to like look into it like could this actually happen and they came back and they said not only could it happen, but it's worse than you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so he became obsessed with computer security for a while. And this eventually led to um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which has been misused over the years, um, most famously against Aaron Schwartz, who was a young genius programmer and activist um, who ended up being overcharged and took his own life under the CFAA. 
Um, What's the CFAA? Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I commonly know yeah. the CFAA. The, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is a arguably uh, one of the worst pieces of technology policy ever written. Um, it is incredibly broad. It mm-hmm. makes uh, it is a crime to access a computer when you shouldn't. That's it. Um, and originally it was accessing a computer that was used in interstate commerce, which back in the 1980s meant like ha- getting into a bank when you weren't supposed to. And now it means or it is it has been argued um, that it means sharing a Netflix password uh, it could be a felony. So it's it's real bad. Uh, the more ex- a recent example was when Biden went to a uh, screening of Mission Impossible. I haven't seen the new one. Apparently there is a villainous AI in it. Uh, he became somewhat fixated on AI policy. I think arguably like that fixation has resulted in better policies. I mean, the so far. Yeah, a lot of what the administration has produced on AI has been somewhat has been largely positive. I will say that there is sort of like a over fixation on like the what they call the X risk, the existential risk of like sometime in the future. AI becoming the matrix or something or, or Terminator and killing us all when a lot of the harms that we see are like it's use in surveillance, it's like unexplainability, it's erroneous output, it being trained on inputs that are um, discriminatory and then spitting out outputs that are discriminatory. All this stuff are like real harms that are happening today. Um, you know, like digital redlining done by AI that we don't know if they're actually doing it because we can't explain how the outputs get out there. Like that kind of stuff is the stuff we're worried about. So I think that they have taken those threats seriously and and we're encouraged by that. But yeah, I I think that like the quality of fiction really informs in a way the quality of tech policy. Um, And it does that also because uh, the, and, and I'll quickly divert to another rant real quick as fast as I can. Um, there was a, uh, a stronger institution for experts to inform the government of like basic facts and things they need to know in order to legislate that was largely dismantled by Newt Gingrich as part of this, like, um, the country's going through an economic downturn. The Congress should tighten its belt too. So they cut a bunch of what they call dead weight off of the congressional budget, and in doing so, got rid of a lot of experts and um, people whose job it was to, like, inform Congress. Um, One of the big offices that was removed was the Office of Technology Assessment. And so, uh, in a lot of ways, like, the capacity for grappling with complicated issues is, is, like, very diminished in Congress. So, staff and and members turn to fiction as sort of a way of like quickly boning up on what are like the vibes of new technology what should i be worried about (laughs) yeah well and it's it's a double-edged sword right because in one sense sci-fi has really given us a vocabulary to articulate things we're worried about which is good um you know we can say preemptively we're worried about the paperclip problem and like most people will know what that is if you don't it's this idea that if you give a, a super powerful ai sufficiently vague instructions to maximize paperclip output, it will liquidate the human race to make more paperclips. Um, you know, so we have a vocabulary for that. We talk about the matrix. Like we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about Whopper from war games, you know, a supercomputer that's in charge of the nuke codes. You know, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, we talk about Skynet, like that's, we have a vocabulary. The problem is that the vocabulary is good for concepts and it's really not good for specific instances. And so a lot of the work in tech policy is unwinding a lot of the assumptions that come with that vocabulary that are baked in. Um, And so, you know, I mostly work on copyright and IP policy, which meant essentially from the moment somebody dropped a deep fake Drake track, I have also worked on AI. Um, And it has been a really fascinating time to watch tech policy in DC because a lot of the initial waves, especially when like chat GPT really came out swinging last spring um, of people just speed running the history of of panic uh, around this. Um, And we were super worried about Skynet for a long time, uh, super worried about uh, Whopper. Everybody was really worried about getting nuked. Um, (laughs) It was a whole thing. 
and trying to actually bridge the gap between the rhetoric that people have available to them and what the reality of the technical solution actually looks like is a, is a big problem. Um, and so when we have these discussions around surveillance, um, you know, we're starting to get into the area where people are thinking about things like minority report, pre-crime. Like we have a vocabulary to talk about pre-crime. We don't want people to be jailed based on an assumption that they might commit a crime in the future. It's great. We can articulate that now. Uh, but the problem is we're kind of sort of already doing that um, with things like sentencing algorithms that compute like so famously um, or famously if you're a turbo nerd uh, uh, like me or folks I work with. Um, so sentencing algorithms are this thing that got really hot, I would say probably like maybe they started about a decade ago. Um, and this question, basically the, the pitch to courts was, hey, uh, you guys are really bad at guessing whether or not someone's going to reoffend um, after they've been in jail. And so use our super magic black box software uh, and it will tell you how long, like what their chance of recidivism is. And they will spit out a recommended sentence for you. The federal sentencing guidelines get really wacky. Uh, state level, it's even wackier. And so judges are like, oh, thank God, someone that could, something that can make the decision for me. Um, and once you actually crack some of these things open, um, at least one of the, the more popular ones, I think in use in Chicago, was uh, found to basically use their their chance of recidivism was essentially just based on the zip code that the person lived in, which is super correlated to your race. Um, so it would spit out things like, oh, if you live in Kenwood, which is a neighborhood in the south side of Chicago, then you're more likely to, you know, you're more likely to reoffend. Also, incidentally, they're probably poor and black. Uh, and so there's this huge systemic problems that come with this. Um, and right now, trying to explain to folks who are um, trying to sort of bridge the snake oil gap of, uh, you know, sci-fi on one hand has taught us to think that computers are all powerful, uh, which can be a real problem when you're trying to say like, no, actually, they're really flawed and they're using these really, really, you know, something like an 80 percent false positive rate for something like ShotSpotter and trying to articulate that when the sales pitch coming from folks is, oh, no, this is a magic computer box that will solve all of your problems for you is like a truly embarrassing amount of uh, the fight in tech policy a lot of the time. I, I want to build on what you just said about computers. My PhD is technology, leadership and innovation. I have done consulting work for law enforcement before. When you mentioned that we are in the most surveilled city in the United States, here is my very first question. Are we in the safest city in the United States? I'm seeing some head shaking. No, why? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> How can this not be the safest city in the country if it's the most surveilled city in the country? Let me give you the answer real quick. Technology is never good or bad. Technology is neutral. It's what the person who controls the technology does with it. So that's the first thing that I always teach my students. Technology is, is never inherently good or bad. Second thing is technology is an accelerant. You think about if there is a small fire burning and you throw a can of gas on it, what's going to happen? It's going to burn faster because you threw an accelerant on it. And Te when it comes to, t to surveillance, AI is the giant tanker gas we're throwing on surveillance right <laughs> Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And here's the thing that I have never shared this in public before. Um, the entity that I was working with, uh, it was a sheriff's department. The sheriff's department arrested somebody in a traffic stop from Georgia. This, this, this was not in Georgia, but the person they arrested at a traffic stop was from Georgia. And when they took the person into custody and ran their ID, there was a warrant from Georgia for this person for murder. And so the sheriff's department did what you do according to policy. You call the Georgia State Police and say, we have so-and-so in custody. Yeah. When are you going to come get him? Uh, we're not. He did not break anything other than a traffic law in the state that he was arrested in. That state cannot prosecute him for murder. They don't have the evidence. But when Georgia was notified 
we have somebody that you have a warrant out for for murder, they refuse to come get him. Not our problem. Why would we want to spend resources to go to another state to pick somebody up and bring them back to hold them on trial? Now you take a system that broken and let's throw billions of dollars in security cameras on it so we can catch more people. Stop. How about we fix the broken system before we speed it up? And th this, this absolutely drives me nuts. How many people do we know broke the law because there are eyewitnesses and we don't have time to deal with that? We got to go install some new cameras. Why? Fix the problem you have in front of you before you go try and fix something else. So exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the audience comment was there's no money there to which we all snickered sadly. Yeah, uh, so on that theme, Hey, Matt, lawmakers keep refusing to do <laughs> anything to stop this surveillance capitalist hellscape from trampling all over our privacy rights. First, can you tell us what is surveillance capitalism and uh, maybe why uh, the U.S. is so far behind most of the rest of the, the developed world in protecting us from it? Yeah, so surveillance capitalism is uh, the idea that the more data that we have on you, the better we'll get at selling you stuff. Um, through like any number of tools, including like AI algorithms to just targeting you with like ads. Um, and so it, it, it's it's very opaque. It's very scary. Uh, I used to follow a surveillance journalist on Twitter. And uh, I think up until recently, it was true that your phones are not actually listening into you and giving you ads based on that. But her line was always that the reality is worse, that it is tracking everyone you're near, uh, everything that they're Googling, it's creating links. And so if they are looking up something that they talk to you about, then you're going to get an ad for it because the phone knows that you were hanging out with someone who was interested in something that they might have talked to you about. Um, and so uh, it, this has been a problem for a while. Um, we have been in various coalitions that have tried to brainstorm ways of, of stopping or at least slowing it down uh it doesn't seem to be the case there's evidence to show that like this might not actually be making that much extra money <laughs> like the the benefit compared to the cost is actually small uh you know as compared to just traditional advertising and sales um but it, it is you know going back to the ota uh What's the OTA? The Office of uh, Technology Assessment bit. Thanks, Leah, for keeping me <laughs> jargon free. Uh, it's a very, honestly, we're miserable people to hang out with because it is, it is, tech policy world in DC is just the most jargon filled. I'm just trolling. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, uh, yeah, so the, Congress is like ill equipped to deal with complicated issues that have a lot of moving parts. In a lot of cases, they have to depend on people to tell them like what's going on for them to know what's going on, which is why Meredith and I have a job. Uh, but uh, it also means that they're hearing what's going on from a lot of business people and a lot of uh, technology vendors and a lot of police departments that have cozy relationships with technology vendors. And the, you know, the net result of that is, is that Anytime that we talk privacy, we always have to deal with the argument that like, if they don't know everything that's going on, uh, another 9-11 is going to happen or like we're all going to die or they're going to put like, uh, I don't know, hallucinogenics in our water supply and everybody's going to be tripping for the next week. It's like a lot of very crazy, silly stories that actually freak people out. Um, we were involved recently with uh, just trying to get like minor improvements on airport security practices in, in terms of surveillance. And like, uh, it we were met with a coalition of like the airports, the technology companies, the TSA, everything telling these like crazy, scary stories um, that were um, largely not quite tethered to reality, but were very believable. And so members freaked out and we kind of, we, we lost that round. So, um, but we are, we are regrouping. 
Yeah, I think it's it's just important to point out, like, there are a lot of advocates, you know, like, including Fight and Public Knowledge and EFF, um, and, like, tons of groups who work on these issues that are very technically heavy in a lot of cases. Um, even so, it is still an asymmetric field for expertise when you're dealing with a company that has any kind of proprietary anything. Um, and so the response of they just don't understand the technology is something that we hear all the time. Um, joke's on you, we actually understand it better than they think. Um, but when you are like, you know, if you're a congressional staffer and the head of the company that makes the, the, the AACS, the, the DVD or the Blu-ray encoding algorithm, when they come and they're like, Oh, trust us, you can't, you can't crack it. It's fine. Uh, they don't understand the technology. And meanwhile, there's like, you know, some hacker hanging over at the FF is like, hey, um, I've definitely done this before. Um, it's an uphill fight to get staffers to believe you in a lot of cases. Um, and that kind of asymmetry is something that comes up a lot in surveillance because often, you know, we have to work off of journalists, frankly, doing big breaking news stories, things like, um, you know, either journalists or some intrepid lawsuit that has happened. Like, you know, the situation with the, the laptop cams getting turned on came out because a, some student noticed the light was on on their webcam and sued the school district. And it came out that it was even worse than anybody had imagined. Um, you know, and it's, it's a, it is an uphill fight. Um, and it's one that we have to deal with every day. Just bringing it back to uh, narratives and storytelling, I, this is kind of one area in which uh, fiction has done us a huge disservice because most popular fiction is the, you know, intrepid role breaking cop or, you know, investigator who is bending the rules and, and you know, um, you know, stretching the bounds of morality to catch the really bad guy. And that's kind of the mental picture that most people in decision making roles have. And so even when you go to them and you say, look at all these harms, like these real active cataloged harms, they're like, yeah, but what about, you know, the terrorists? What about the dangerous people? What about the evil people? What about the gangs? Um, and so um, it, it's really kind of hard to undo that narrative in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's is it is very hard to go into a conversation, especially around things like encryption, when the response is, but what about CSAM? just child sexual abuse material um, is is the comeback in a lot of cases. It's like, well, but if there's encryption, we can't find all the CSAM. And like, do you want kids to get hurt? And it's like, no, nobody wants kids to get But trying to reframe these as like all policy at the end of the day is a calculated trade-off between risks and rewards. Uh, you have to think about the systemic risks and the systemic injuries to a system against the problems that it's actually going to solve and whether or not those are worth it. Um, and those are kind of difficult conversations to have, and they're doubly difficult conversations when one side is like very much not interested in having them. And with this, there, and and so that's why we want to do this short story contest and do this toolkit because lawmakers um, and just pop culture in general need to hear what's going on from authors who know what they're talking about. They need to hear more than the story of the kid, who, the 12 year old girl who's abducted uh, and, and found by facial recognition. They need to hear stories that are like the real life 12 year old girl who was misidentified by facial recognition and kicked out by herself at night from the skate the skating rink that she tried to go to with her friends. And what happens to that girl from there? And how is she found and how does her community take care of her etc cetera, etc cetera. um and by the way face scans at airports just as an aside you could still opt out of those and it'd be great if you would um let's see where do we want to go to from here we've got uh 20 minutes left i definitely want to make room for you all to ask questions i think that uh Maybe we could focus a little bit more on story and perhaps the ways that we uh we do actually change those narratives and push back against that in our work. I'll give an example that isn't really directly re related to propaganda. I just love this one and it almost got us sued. So here we go. Let's have some fun. Uh, so back at the start of the pandemic, academic institutions, when they were shut down and had to switch to remote learning, were really scrambling for legitimacy when it came to remote learning, people having to take classes on computers. And legitimacy and testing was a huge 
uh, they decided it was a huge problem uh, and, uh, and began to have these partnerships, often through textbook companies themselves, which was really insidious, where you buy the textbook, you automatically get your, your, your Proctorio e-proctoring software um, that uh, very quickly came to be covered by all of these fantastic journalists uh, because students were tweeting about things like, I'm black, this thing can't recognize me, I have to work with a lamp in front of my face, or I am, it, this thing will say that I'm cheating if I get up and leave, so I'm pissing in this water bottle, or what, or what have you. And an increasing number of, uh, of, of professors, of students were starting to speak out against these technologies and the company's responses were to intimidate the crap out of students and out of professors alike with really scary legal letters to the point that uh, it was becoming difficult to get, find people who would talk about their experiences or who would identify themselves because they were so afraid of getting sued by these companies for defamation or who knows what. There were a couple of people whose lives were pretty much ruined by that. And so in the middle of pushing back against this, this, facial rec this racist facial recognition and just creepy creepy, ableist stuff, <laughs> everything. It was every is that you've got uh, this situation. Uh, we decided to launch a website called um, Mike Olson's Teenage Lap Cam uh, with, Mike, with Mike Olson being the CEO of Proctorio, one of the most popular uh, <laughs> uh, popular e-proctoring companies out there. And it was one of the quietest drops of a website that fight for the future has ever done it was a full-on like parody website of this technology selling it as uh as as like fully the creepy thing that it was asking college students high school students to literally film your lap film your whole room show us your show us your whole world etc and uh basically nobody covered it Nobody said anything, but we watched in the ensuing weeks as we got plenty of traffic and people started talking about it again, because if in the end they didn't go after us for our, our website, which they, they could have, they could have tried, you know, they could have tried to intimidate it down, but it was such a come at me, bro, that ultimately, uh, they didn't. And what that did was open back up the space for people to start talk about their experiences and to fight back against these technologies. And the, the space became stronger again because of that. Uh, and that's kind of a weird sort of resistance, you know, just to, 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 to basically say, to say the words about a technology that everybody else is too afraid to say. And that can happen very much in fictional spaces, very much in metaphor. Um, and 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 be very influential on not just policymakers but also on communities. So that's that's one story of resistance and storytelling against surveillance from Fight for the Future that was incredibly effective. And yeah, anybody got anything else? Can we actually? I would love to hear um, before we open up to audience questions if folks have a recommendation for their their favorite anti propaganda piece of fiction. I got two. Go for it. I, I highly recommend a movie that came out about 20 years ago called The Lives of Others. It's a period piece set back in East Germany before the wall fell, but uh, The Lives of Others is a phenomenal movie. It is a work of fiction, but it is very plausible fiction because it depicts what the Cold War was like from a surveillance standpoint. The other um, work of fiction I highly recommend is a book by Brad Thor called Blacklist. This book came out 16 days before Edward Snowden went public with his revelations about the NSA. And he, the story of the book in a sentence, a couple of people in U.S. intelligence agencies use their vast troves of personal data to blackmail a couple of key members of Congress to kill privacy legislation and to increase the three-letter agency budgets. Now. I'm thankful that's a work of fiction and that could never happen in real life. But as a fiction book, that is a fantastic fiction book. Isn't that the uh, the inspiration for Enemy of the State movie? 
I'm not sure which one came out first because Enemy of the State came out real close to that yeah. timing, but I can't remember which came first. Enemy of the State would be my recommendation. It's kind of an older movie, uh, but it is one that I watched as a, a a young, very young adult with my friend that I talked about earlier, and I think it is the reason why he is so private to this day. Because uh, when we walked out of the movie, he was like visibly freaked. Like we had seen horror movies together. I would never seen him that scared after a movie. Uh, I've got three. Um, one is uh, John Carpenter's classic Escape from New York, um, which was explicitly made as a rebuttal to Dirty Harry. In fact, <laughs> um, and Escape from New York is it's just it's a delightful piece of like 80s crime panic rebuttal. Um, the other two are two short stories. Um, I highly recommend them if you can find them online. Um, one is called Stet by Sarah Gailey, which is in a, an online lit mag called Fireside. Um, and it is a sort of STET, S-T-E-T. Um, I won't give away too much of it, but it has to do with autonomous cars and decision making. Um, incredible. I, it has completely changed how I think about autonomous vehicles. Um, and the other one is a, is a short story that I think won the Hugo last year called Rabbit Test, um, which is by Samantha Mills. It's an uncanny magazine. It is about um, reproductive surveillance. It is incredibly chilling and moving. Um, I had stopped using period trackers after reading this story. Um, and it is it is absolutely phenomenal. Go read it if you can. Uh, I just remember the center of my e-proctoring story, so I'll go ahead and give that to you all. I definitely have a case of the 4 p.m.s. Uh, that website is the only thing that I've ever worked on that's been um, that's been in a UNESCO publication, which was pretty cool. Uh, to show how impactful it was, um, and then I would recommend, and this is more as an alternatives as a as a something to look to for how we might approach things like global level moments of import, crises, environment, et cetera, from a community governance perspective. I really like Ruthanna Emrys's A Half Built Garden which is a novel. Um, yeah, I think that with that, unless anybody else, I'm, we could talk endlessly about this, but <laughs> we've got about 12 minutes left. Do people have questions um, that they, yeah, they'd like to bring? Right yes, up to the walk mic. up yeah. to the mic and let's, let's I, make a little cue. I'm also just curious, how many people in the audience are writers, uh, storytellers, dungeon, Storytell any, any dungeon masters? There we go. <laughs> Dungeon masters are extremely valid. Yeah. In fact, arguably more valid than seeing <laughs> I have tried to do both. DMing is way harder. Hey, everybody. My words generally don't fight back. Hello. Uh, an anti propaganda recommendation into a question, which is one of the originals. Um, Mark Twain wrote a great short story called The Great White Elephant, which is about the New York City Police Department trying to find an elephant that's been kidnapped from the circus and sends officers everywhere around the world looking for it. And eventually it's found years later dead and decomposed in the basement of a precinct because somebody had found it and forgot to report it. And so, <laughs> you know, in the 19th century, police are incredibly known for being corrupt and brutal. And to me, that that is it leads into the one of the ultimate pieces of propaganda, which is Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> which starts the archetype of the like gentleman detective who knows about science and, and chemistry and reasoning. Um, and you can see its legacy in CSI and Bones and Mindhunter and the alias and all these things like we don't do things like you do with guns. We're like scientists and we solve crimes. And I think there's this real uh, genre in propaganda of like police have a level of expertise that you do not know and you do not have access to. It's kind of like a, you know, what they call competency born, obviously, in fiction. And so I was wondering in your experience with seeing propaganda in fiction, how much of it is about um, expertise? And and science and um, and and competency. I would say so much. Uh, this is funny. This connects to a conversation that I had at D Web Camp a couple of weeks back, um, where we were talking about how expertise was has been wielded as a weapon for a really long time to silence uh, people who also. May, or who may even be more qualified than the quote unquote expert speaker uh, just by uh, nature of, 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 of their privilege or whatever label they're able to apply themselves. If I could just throw one, one thing in there, 
one of my favorite shows from an entertainment standpoint was Numbers. You had one brother that was an FBI agent. The other was a math savant professor who was always cracking uh, crimes by solving an equation. I think uh, House is actually an undersung uh, yeah, part of that genre, um, which is wild because in some of the episodes of House, like the other doctors go and do full CSI style. Like who, they're like going and like dusting the home. There's one where they like go dig the sand, the sand out of a kid's sandbox. And like, it's like, what hospital? <laughs> anyway. I honestly don't have anything to add to that, but I will just say that like uh, in dealing with this stuff, it is a constant disappointment about how far from the truth those shows are. <laughs> I mean, it's a constant disappointment <laughs> how far from the truth so many of the representations of surveillance tech are. Yeah. And, and I think that that gets the, to the question here is that uh, we, we, you know, we're here as a part of an effort to make authors, fiction writers of all stripes feel like they have the expertise and the grounding that they need to talk about these things because they're just as qualified as probably 80% of the people who are so-called experts. Yeah, and even just the systems are not as expert as they are made out to be. I know there was recently a big FTC settlement with uh, Rite Aid because um, they were using an AI facial recognition software to like identify uh, shoplifters or like people who were previous shoplifters and they kept misidentifying innocent people and they would like walk them away and, and harass them and stuff like that. And so they are now banned from using that technology for something 10 years as part of the settlement. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, sort of on that similar topic of expertise, um, as well as what we've talked about before, one of my favorite series is Person of Interest. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how, so Person of Interest shows that there's like a super AI that does, you know, identifies pre-crime, but it's not and it, it provides the information to the government, but it's not controlled by the government. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what are your thoughts on whether it would be, if, if something like that was to be widely in use, would it be more likely and better for it to be owned and sort of controlled by the government? or a private entity? That's, I, I love this question. Um, <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, right now, the reality is that, so like take social media websites. So for a long time, in theory, in theory, if you go to law school and you come out of law school a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, brand new lawyer, you think, oh, if the police want some information about the content of your Facebook direct messages, they need to get a warrant. No, they don't. They need to show up and ask. And 100% uh, of the time, Facebook will just turn it over. Um, and this is true of basically every major social media platform. Ironically, one of the few holdouts to that for a long time was Twitter prior to its current ownership. Um, now, having said that, you, you've got this trade-off, right? So the idea of like, if the AI is run by the state, so if you have like a real minority report situation where you've got the, the government with the control of the super AI, um, the government are the ones who have the guns, which is a problem. Um, the flip side of that is there are some known windows of transparency into the government. Like we have FOIA, there are, and we can argue till the cows come home about whether they're sufficient. I don't think they are, but they do exist. If you have it on a private side, for one thing, that data is probably just going to go straight to the government anyway. You have way fewer checks and balances on a private corporation than you theoretically do on the government. Now, on a practical matter, does Amazon have guns? Not as far as I know. Um, but, you know, that's that's kind of the trade off. And there's a third idea here, which be, it would be some sort of AI that is open source, publicly auditable, publicly owned, et cetera, that might potentially be more transparent and accessible um, and changeable by public outcry. Uh, but I think that any of any of the above is still pretty hairy. <laughs> I want it to be owned by me personally. Yeah, that's the best option. I will just say that, like, and I hate to be a downer all the time, but like, that's your job. Yeah, the um, I mean, classic corporate lobbying is around uh, like 
government as a customer. And so like the idea is, is that your lobbyists are your salesmen. <laughs> And so a lot of fights are around like who gets to supply the government with all these shiny technology resources. And there was recently a huge fight over like who got to run the cloud back in for the DOD that was like super messy. Um, but I don't know, it, it, it's, it's kind of used as a weapon as to like what technology government can and can't have and what gets funded and what doesn't. Um, there was an initiative in the Obama administration called like the 18th floor or something like that to bring uh, government competency in developing their own technology tools. Uh, the industry, I know for a fact, because I know somebody that does this, lobbies against the 18th floor and tries to besmirch them and say that they're a waste of government money and awful and terrible and you know probably kick puppies and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of the state of the, the relationship the government has technology right now. And until that sort of relationship gets fixed, dude, it's it's just it's a mess. <laughs> All right, we've only got a couple more minutes. We got a couple of Sorry. questions, so we will keep rolling. So if those surveillance data collecting methods have gotten way too out of control and there is so much data being collected, is there any hope in the idea that the haystack is getting too big to find the needle? There's just so much data that it's become functionally useless? Or will it ever, and follow? And second tangent question, is there any value in us, the individual citizens, creating junk data on purpose? I, yeah, you are. I'll, I'll take your second question first. I believe poisoning the well with junk data is probably one of the few things an individual citizen can do. I mean, we, we can continue asking Congress, asking state legislatures to pass laws to protect us from big business and the data brokers. But in terms of what can you do as a private citizen using burner phone numbers, using burner emails, creating fake identities of people that don't exist and flooding data brokers with 16 versions of your first name, middle initial and last name, um, put enough junk out there. If, if you have 16 addresses in Atlanta rather than one, what address do I assign new data to? Um, basically poison the well of uh, the data brokers. I just want to say that that's a short story I would really want to read. <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing is I can role play as my original characters online and I am yeah. adding a net benefit to humanity. Yes. There, there is already a, so there's a tool and I'm blanking on the name to like spike the data of like uh, gen AI models. Yeah. And as someone who thinks that like machines have the right to read, I also simultaneously think that that is the coolest act of civil disobedience ever. So I'm kind of like very, you know, on this on both sides of that issue. But like having that for surveillance data is just a phenomenal idea. <laughs> and I'll pop in to answer the first half of the question. The too much data problem has been a big problem um, up until now because what's happening is that. AIs are accelerating our, the ability to process the giant haystack um, and to find the needles faster than faster than ever before. And so we are more concerned, I think, than we've been ever before that the vo incredible volumes of data, even like CCTV footage or what have you, can be processed faster and faster by the AIs and ultimately used against us. So next question. Uh, AI dev here too. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, Yes, I agree. There is a lot of misinformation that's taken from public media um, that helps us, you know, inspire, you know, those in our field to, you know, bring more things to the field and, and you know, what have you. Um, and it does do a poor job of setting expectations that may be a little outlandish, too. I totally agree. However, I do also feel, and I'm, I'm curious to know what you feel concerning, that potentially the opposite is also true. That even as someone in the industry, that we have a hard time even building or mustering up a sense of urgency concerning potential, like real potential doomsday concepts and ideas. Do you feel like that that is a also risk from the, the, the direction that we're trying to go with spreading information in a very practical sense about AI usage and, and even surveillance? I, I would, I'm not concerned about that today because most of what I've heard 
people on Congress react to, and that includes staff, it's like a big tent of like everyone there, is the X risk stuff. And so it's kind of like it's not like we're trying what to like X risk ex existential risk. Um, and so I, I think it's more of just like a rebalancing of like priorities and that not erasing the idea that there is ex existential risk. Okay, last question. We have to wrap it up. Thanks. With all the data from various sources that is being collected on us in, in the surveillance, you, you guys use Minority Report. It's kind of like the, the check in. How far in the future do you really think precog is? Like doing risk assessment and arresting or cloistering people off that have been identified as high risk for whatever the case may be? So uh, I. Many, I haven't done it in a long time, but um, I used to run a podcast uh, and we actually did an entire episode about this question. <laughs> um, so go to where you get your podcasts. It's called Ad Absurdum. Um, one of our first, I think our very first episode was on the very assault on the concept of the Fourth Amendment uh, that was Minority <laughs> Report. Yeah. Um, the short answer is I think there are, there are certain guardrails in American jurisprudence that mean you, you, can't, you can't get a conviction on basis of something like pre-crime. Now, whether those stick around may or may not be wishful thinking on my part. I also caveat this with I'm not a criminal lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, but my understanding from my friends who are uh, is that, you know, we do have a surveillance risk. And I think the, the bigger risk from that is continued surveillance and police harassment rather than actually getting thrown in cuffs and thrown in a cell. Yep. Or they're looking for an excuse to um, to arrest you and they keep showing up over and over yeah. again, which is something that there's already an algorithm. I think it's in Miami um, that police have been using for years as an excuse to surveil, harass uh, and just bother the crap out of people um, based on what an AI says about their likelihood that they'll commit a crime. So it's 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 happening to a certain extent. And I would say that the more the police are in front of your house, the more likely they are to see something that they could arrest you for. And if they're biased to think that you are about to commit a crime, they're going to probably look for that excuse. I, I would just make one comment. Pray you never get labeled as an enemy combatant because then the fourth amendment doesn't apply. Yep. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, like again, today I am less concerned about a super smart AI than I am about uh, the tyranny of a dumb AI that is given too much power. <laughs> Uh, especially considering just the like overly aggressive sales pitches that I have seen about the capabilities of life systems. And I'm not saying that like, you know, designers aren't doing a good job. I'm saying that like the C-suite people are pushing the products way faster than they're ready to be products, uh, and uses that they're not ready to be used for because they want to make money today on an expensive, uh, to develop. Yeah. product and so. ultimately this is a, it's a very human story it's yeah. a story of capitalism it's a story <laughs> of grift it's a story uh that that we all can tell we're all pretty familiar with uh whatever the intricacies of the technology it's it's definitely being overhyped and oversold and used to do bad things that have real human impact um i know that we're probably over time now so i just want to thank everybody so much for this panel it's been so fun uh if you get a chance, please uh, rate our panel on the DragonCon app. 